Hello and welcome back to this Down for Idealistic Crusade. This video is the latest in my Laserdisc collection series where I go over all the various new titles I picked up from fellow collectors or what I found in local used shops. And in this one I have some really interesting titles and so I'll start with the box sets. This first one is uh, actually perfect for this time since it uh, was literally just this past week uh, Judy Garland's centenary. So celebrating her what would have been her 100th year it was really fitting to stumble across the beautiful Judy Garland Golden Years MGM set that MGM UA did. This is one of their ultra fancy premium releases that brings together three features, the Harvey Girls, the Pirate, and Summerstock, with brand new transfers in CAV with a boatload of extras, including, uh, rather interestingly, uh, an audio commentary with the director of the Harvey Girls, who was still uh, alive at this point, and original music recordings along with isolated score pieces all over the analog tracks. So this is a rather uncommon box. It's, it's It was very surprising to find, especially in great shape, but it's also one where the insert is very important because not only do you have a beautiful write-up, but you have all of the technical information on the booklet. So when you open the booklet, it looks pretty straightforward until you realize this is one of those MGM releases, like their complete showboat set, where you really need the booklet because it's a program guide. So you actually have to fold it out. It's a trifold. You have to fold it out and all of the extensive program liner notes go across the rest of the trifold booklet. And this tells you about all of the additional music recordings in addition to the commentary. And you do have to, of course, have your remote handy to be able to switch between all of them. This is extremely extensive for Laserdisc because it's also got an entire supplemental features package. It includes a theatrical trailers gallery not for not just these films, but other Judy Garland films and other MGM musicals. Then there is an entire extremely extensive stills gallery with its own chapter breakdowns. And then you get all of the various notes on the supplemental material. And then, only then, does it get into the audio music program uh, for the analog tracks describing the chapter breakdowns on the various sides of where you'll find all of the additional music extras on the analog tracks. So again, this is one of the most extensive box sets MGM ever did in terms of celebrating films with extensive supplemental features on Laserdisc. You could tell this was really a major labor of love for everyone because not only do you get the extensive notes, but the back actually has a producer's note. So this is George Feltenstein, who we all love and adore from his work at the Warner Archive. Well, this was went back in his uh, days at MGM UA Home Video. He has an entire producer's note about the importance of this release, the work that went into it, and other Judy Garland films not included in this set are listed over here, what they had available on Laserdisc at the time. And then you get the full technical notes, and there's even a thank you to director George Sidney for participating in this Laserdisc box set release. And of course, the box itself just houses the disc with your collectible foam insert inside. Uh, again, this is a full CAV presentation, so the discs themselves are in paper sleeves, and they are spread across nine different sides. So that is MGM UA's incredible Judy Garland box set, the uh, Golden Years at MGM release of three films. And again, I do think this is one of the most extensive supplemental sections I've ever seen on a Laserdisc presentation. This is a fantastic box set that I can't wait to dig into. I don't know if all of the various extras have made it over to successive releases. I'm sure most of them have, but if it's anything like the, the Showboat box set, not all 100% of those things always make it over. Uh, this is very similar to also the extras package you'll see if you ever get the Ultimate Wizard of Oz box set that MGM did where they really pulled out all the stops in the extras department. They did so again here and again I think this is essential for all Judy Garland fans who have a laser displayer and it's also one of the box sets that's so extensive and has the amazing liner notes and all the extras that if you do find a copy and you don't have a player this is a, a very nice uh, collectible piece in terms of all of the materials and it might encourage you to then get a 
player. This is an absolutely extraordinary, impressive Laserdisc release. Uh, it is not a very common box set, and it is one of the most stuffed to the gills releases that MGM UA ever did. So I can't wait to dig into this uh, because I've been meaning to uh, look at some of, of Garland's films because of her centenary and Warner Archive released uh, several new Blu-ray titles, including uh, my favorite film that I've, I've seen of Garland's, which is uh, 1945's The Clock, which is severely underrated, and um, I only actually have it on Laserdisc, so that's one I'm looking forward to getting the Blu-ray upgrade, but uh, until then, I can't wait to dig into this amazing box set. Then the second and other box set, also MGM UA, and also one that if the Garland set is very uncommon, this one is not particularly common, but it is a title a lot of Laserdisc enthusiasts try to get, so it usually has a little bit of a premium price tag. Not not terribly much, but uh, it's definitely something you don't stumble across in a store for under five bucks, so that's why I was so happy to finally find the CAV box set release of Poltergeist. So this is the MGM letterbox full CAV encoded version, which gets its own box. While this looks like at first it's a movie only release, it does have a nice little supplemental section at the end. Uh, it does have a PCM uh, Dolby surround encoded track that approximates the original Dolby stereo release. And it also, again, the extras go into just not just the trailer and some stills galleries, but you get the making of the film vintage documentary piece along with, uh, it's, it's essentially trying to be like a Criterion supplement a little bit, and that was something very rare for a lot of the major studios and a sign of the film's enduring popularity. So if you want the most spiffed up version of the film on Laserdisc, that's why you want to go for this set. It was later reissued as one of those stealth AC3 reissues much later on. Uh, that disc is rather hard to find and can get quite pricey and is probably going to use the, the same base master. So basically, you give up the CAV encoding and the little bit of extras for the later pressing with AC3. But still, you don't come across this box version without having to pay uh, more like 10 or $20 at least. Uh, there are no inserts. It's just disc inside a box, and this does have a little bit of wear, but it's it's pretty so in pretty good solid shape. And again, I was very surprised to stumble across the uh, the full CAV box for under five bucks. I also got some really interesting Japanese imports from some various group sellers. Uh, this one coming up is easily the disc out of all of the ones I'm going to go over in this video that I have wanted to get the most and it's part of a series that is exceptionally difficult to collect here in the US and is technically the best presentation of this film on the format. That is the CIC video from Japan 1993 release of the Universal Horror 1932 masterpiece directed by Carl Freund, The Mummy, starring Boris Karloff. This is, uh, again, technically the best presentation of the film on disc. Uh, here in the U.S., we just got the old Encore edition, which I have, and is solid for its era, but I always wanted this to have a nice issue with PCM mono audio and uh, you know a presentation that was much better like the sequels got in the Mummy collection. So you have to turn to the 1993 Japanese releases for the most of the key original Universal Horror films that spawned the various sequels and, and the whole notion of Universal Horror. So this, of course, uses the iconic early 1990s classic monsters collection vhs artwork which you get it across an entire laser disc jacket it looks stunning still has the original gold obi strip and it's in immaculate shape it does have the little universal logo in a box in the upper corner like most releases of universal titles that cic video did this is like what they did with their reissues of the hitchcock films and because this is from 1993 it has the all-important pcm mono track which is why i was so interested in finding the other uh, universal horror films released in japan at this time because trying to find the best audio source for these films is extremely difficult due to the fact that the source elements are very compromised they were printed and reprinted and reissued to absolute death and a lot of modern releases use different versions and always 
typically almost always hit them with a load of noise reduction. So that's why I'm most excited about this disc and why I've wanted to find it for so long. So I will be doing very intensive audio comparisons to the other releases I have and have tried out. And um, But I have to say that the, the actual jacket art is quite impressive. Not all, uh, well, most of the, the releases that they did at this time, uh, they all follow suit with using the USB HS art and then having the, uh, the custom logo Universal made. So you get the Universal Studios Monsters logo that we all grew up with in the 90s. And I'm, I'm thinking this is probably going to be the same source master or print used from the old Encore Edition Laserdisc, but with slight upgrades in terms of it being a later pressing and having a PCM digital track in addition to the old rather noisy analog track of the Encore Disc. So again, this this is just, I can't believe I, I finally have a copy of this and I'm able to check it because again, this is technically the best presentation of the film on LD, but of course being Japanese, you will have to deal with Japanese subtitles. Then as a really wonderful bonus, um, that was the only disc I ordered from that seller, but he had some other discs that he was trying to sell and I didn't expect this at all. So I thought the box seemed a little heavy when it got to me and I opened it and I saw there were two discs inside, which I thought, well, no, I only ordered one. But he very graciously threw in this immaculate copy of the rental version of Lawrence of Arabia. So this is the Japanese pressing that I've looked at before, but this is the wonderful Laserdisc rental version. So of course it has the rental sticker. The jacket itself is relatively the same as the standard Japanese release. It looks absolutely gorgeous in its printing and its color and its uses of imagery. Of course, the main body text is in Japanese, as of course it would be. But the primary draw of the rental discs and why they are so collectible isn't necessarily the contents of the release itself. It's how the actual discs were made. And... That refers to the fact that the actual disc itself, like almost all rental discs, is this beautiful golden color. So now I have Lawrence of Arabia with this beautiful gold disc presentation across the two CLV discs. So again, technically it is the same as the standard Japanese release. The only difference being you get the exclusive rental catalog number and marks on the jacket and the disc labels. But the discs themselves are this beautiful gold-colored plastic. So that's why the Laserdisc rental uh, disc itself has such a, a, a great cachet to collecting them. That's why so many people love them. This is only now one of a, a few rental discs that I have. And I still marvel how awesome <laughs> this gold coloring looks. So yes, I know it's just a different colored plastic. It doesn't really mean anything. But boy does this look cool so uh the, i can't say thank you enough for this wonderful extra bonus that was packed in then i got two additional japanese imports from luke chinkata the our, our resident man in japan from the laserdisc wolfpack podcast if you haven't seen those episodes where He's in Japan and always hunting down amazing laser finds in the various uh, Japanese stores. So he sent me this beautiful copy of 1965's The Great Race. So this is the Blake Edwards uh, it's sort of it, it, epic roadshow comedy film that has, has a great following and it's a wonderful film to come back to. But this has this wonderful, extremely striking art, and it also has the Obi strip that is one of the few that's actually a top uh, Obi strip in terms of it actually goes across the top like this instead of going across the side. It's also one of the cool Japanese ones where the Obi strip designates this as being a 70 millimeter film release, and so they made this custom logo that they would use occasionally on the Obi strips for films that were 70 millimeter films. And it in addition to having the official widescreen Laserdisc logo that you'll see all over the Laserdisc database, so that's another cool touch. It's also got this really incredible gatefold that's got full of wonderful imagery, and then the back itself is also lovely. So I do think this is the best packaging the film has ever received. It is available on Blu-ray, and it's at least you know out there in HD, 
but this is such an incredible package that I am, I am very much looking forward to checking out the transfer on this disc. This does have a uh, Dolby Surround encoded PCM. Obviously, being a 70 millimeter roadshow, this would have had uh, six track magnetic audio, which would be, you know, in a discrete 5.1 codec on a modern Blu ray. But uh, this should still give you the experience, but of course, not in discrete form. But again, this is just an amazing package design and uh, far beyond what we got in the US for the standard Laserdisc release. So this is just another one of those examples where the Japanese packaging will sometimes knock it out of the park so much that it just obliterates the the uh, very plain US counterpart. Of course, Luke also knows, like everybody who watches this channel, about my absolute Ronin obsession. So he hooked me up with this beautiful Japanese pressing of John Frankenheimer's 1998 masterwork. This follows pretty much everything about the US release, has the same art. Thankfully, it did remove the, uh, the critical blurb that was on the center of the art, and the color's a little different. It's got the MGM late era band in the upper corner for their home entertainment label. Uh, it has the original Obi strip, which is this sort of burgundy color. Uh, it does have a gatefold, and art-wise, it is very much following what you see on the U.S. release, but of course, the key difference being all the text is in Japanese. Just like the standard U.S. release, this has Dolby Surround encoded PCM, and it has AC3 5.1. Uh, the USLD has the great Frankenheimer commentary and uh, a few little extras. I think the commentary and the extras are on here. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, Japanese releases didn't always carry over extras sections. Like uh, when you get the Japanese GoldenEye, that has none of the extensive special features the standard U.S. release does. But uh, I'm, I think this one has the commentary and the extras, but uh, again, I'm not 100% for sure. Um, if you're really interested, you will want to make sure uh, that you have the disc with the extras on it if you want that but of course those are all available on the later dvds and the uh, of course the wonderful arrow blu-ray release as well uh, this is just another edition of the film i've always wanted to check out it gets me one step closer for full ronin completion uh, I, I, over time i have wound up collecting every major release so uh, the the only two releases that i currently don't own of this film are uh, the DTS Laserdisc, which is quite pricey, and uh, I've never gotten a, a good deal on one. And I have been tempted, even though I have no use for it. Uh, the film did get a UMD release for Sony's handheld PSP system. And if I ever found one cheap enough, I might be tempted just because... It's another copy of Ronin, so I also can't wait for the uh, 4K announced release that's coming from Kino Lorber, so uh, when that arrives, I'm going to start my Ronin craziness all over again. Next are a couple Criterion titles I picked up. I'm... I've never tried to go 100% full spine completion, but there are still many Criterion titles I would love to pick up, and uh, if I see a cheap uh, minty Criterion, well, I'm not just going to leave it sitting there. So I guess eventually I might uh, get full spine completion just from picking up the odd title here and there. This is one of the ones I've been wanting from the early days of Criterion. So this is spine number 24, and that is, of course, Hitchcock's Young and Innocent. This is in the black cover design. It is analog-only sound, but this was, for the longest time, the best video presentation on an official release of one of the masterpieces of Hitchcock's late British period. So this was the release I wish I'd had growing up as a kid if I'd had a laser displayer instead of all the endless unbelievably awful public domain VHS tapes and uh, the handful of times it might turn up on a TV channel from some awful print. Uh, this is the release I wish I had. Uh, this was it done concurrently with Criterion doing other masterpieces of Hitchcock's British period like the 39 Steps and so basically this is coming out along with uh, Sabotage and uh, Blackmail came a little bit later. So of course it got a fancier Criterion release and digital sound. So unfortunately this didn't get digital sound, but I am very curious to check out the transfer. It's just a single CLV disc without extras. But again, this was at the time and for really until we got the various cleaned up uh, European DVDs in the early 2000s, this was one of, if not the best way to see Young and Innocent in the States. So 
again, I'm very curious to check out the transfer, uh, see what sort of print they were able to use, and uh, compare it to the other versions. And of course, it's got one of his most famous shots, the long tracking shot through the party going on in the ballroom that goes all the way back to the drummer that's playing uh, in the climax of the film. So uh, if you've seen that reference, that's where th- this this is where that that famous shot comes from. And it's it's a fantastic Hitchcock thriller from uh, really it hits. 1938, so it's at the end of his British period, but this is when his confidence is on full display in everything he's doing, and this would be right before he would leave on his Selznick contract and come to Hollywood. Uh, So this is basically just after the first handful of of masterpieces like The Man Who Knew Too Much, 39 Steps, Sabotage, and uh, coming before the uh, the the slightly problematic Jamaica Inn in 1939, and then Hitchcock leaves and goes to Hollywood. So uh, this is an absolute classic of his British period. It's a must see, and I can't wait to see what the old Criterion disc looks like. Next is Spine 25A, which is their release of the masterpiece Grand Illusion with this beautiful custom art. Of course, Grand Illusion was Criterion's spine number one on the DVD side of things, and that restarted their spine numbering. Uh, They've since lost the rights, and I've got the Studio Canal Blu-ray, but I've always wanted to check this particular version out. I really do like what they did with the art, and it's when Criterion was stepping up their game in the technical realm and the art design on Laserdisc. So this has a much more modernized cover design, you get the usual Criterion essay. It's just a film-only disc on CLV, but it does have one major extra, which is the uh, Peter Cowie uh, audio commentary, which I think got carried over to their DVD release. But uh, again, I was very happy to find this version. It does have PCM mono audio, and it does, of course, have English subtitles. But if you want this masterpiece on Laserdisc, this is going to be the version that you'll want to seek out uh, for the best technical presentation and, of course, the audio commentary as well. And again, I really love what they did with the art. So uh, it is a nice displayable Laserdisc jacket. So next and last of the Criterion Discs is Spine 114, which is Kurosawa's 1952 masterpiece, Ikiru, with this unbelievably gorgeous jacket art. They've always used this incredible image, which is a perfect cover for the film, but I really love what Criterion did with the sort of light green, sort of mint green for the banner and the title, and I love the bigger space for the image on the jacket, so I think this is a beautiful uh, jacket. I think it's one of Criterion's better uh, non-fancy box set or trifold um, uh, jackets. I think it's very displayable, and I'm also curious to see what the transfer looks like. Uh, if you've never seen this film, this is one of the most emotionally taxing films I think you can ever see in your life. Uh, if you're not just a, a, a blubbering wreck by the end of it, um, you have nerves of steel. <laughs> uh, I'll just I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, the less description you have of this film, the better, I think. Uh, but it is not a, a film. I mean, I mean, there is there are uplifting qualities to it, but it is very, very very extraordinarily, unbelievably sad and brutally honest. So uh, it it is quite possibly my favorite Kurosawa film. I find it impossible to choose a particular favorite uh, because they're all, they they all have their own distinct identities, but this one is right up there. And again, I can't see it or even think of it without just immediately having all the emotions come, come back (laughs) flooding once again. Uh, Again, the rear cover looks beautiful. It It carries over that same sort of mint green color, I love what they did with this. The layout is beautiful. This does have a PCM mono track, so it does give you digital sound. Unfortunately, there are no extras, but Criterion would later do their big special edition DVD with extras, and I'm really hoping that they get to do a Blu-ray, and I'm, I'm really hoping they do a giant Kurosawa box set, as I think we all are. So I will admit I haven't picked up all of their Kurosawa Blu-ray releases yet because I'm still holding off in, in hopes of, of of them doing a big Kurosawa box set with like some new uh, 4K transfers and things like that. 
but still, this is a, a beautiful uh, jacket design from Criterion. The only issue is it is a two-disc affair, and it doesn't have a gatefold, so it is very tricky finding a copy of this without seam splitting or bends, and this copy was in a local store and in really beautiful shape, as you can see here, so I was very happy to finally pick up the LD version. Next is one of the really cool double feature releases that MGM did from the United Artists Library. So this is a Western double feature pairing Duel at Diablo with Hour of the Gun. Uh, I haven't seen Diablo yet, but I have seen Hour of the Gun, which is basically John Sturges, the great John Sturges, getting to do his version of the gunfight at the OK Corral, when it's supposed to have a, the, the idea is that it's the a more accurate telling of, of the actual historical events. Of course, it is full of dramatization, but it's another of the well-made films telling that same story. So I think, you know, it belongs in the list with, of course, Gunfight at the OK Corral and especially uh, My Darling Clementine, among others like Tombstone. But this is a wonderful uh, package. It is letterbox for both films. And as MGM would do with their handful of double feature releases, you get nice poster reproductions for both films with nice size to them and a rather nice gatefold with the usual uh, MGM mixture of imagery with tinting, and then you get your chapter stops, and then this lovely shot of the uh, just before the major gunfight of all the main characters lined up in the street on the uh, other gatefold panel. The back gives you the general information about both films. They do have PCM mono soundtracks, and they are letterboxed, which was a first for both films. And then, uh, unlike a lot of double feature or multi-feature releases, each film gets its own disc, so they don't run into each other, which is also really helpful if you watch the films separately over two different nights. I'm very excited to check this release out. I've always wanted to get a copy of this, but every time I find one, it's usually a bit overpriced. Uh, they, they don't pop up all the time, at a lower price, but it's a really wonderful uh, MGM double feature release. So I do very much recommend this for uh, LD enthusiasts if you stumble across one, because they didn't do a whole lot of these where the films were given nice new letterbox transfers with PCM audio and their trailers. So this is unfortunately an exception rather than the rule. Next for my director's shelf, I managed to find the LD for Peter Bogdanovich's What's Up Doc with the beautiful artwork. Uh, this is, again, a stunning jacket that uses original art. It's a Warner Brothers disc that doesn't clutter everything with a ton of crap, and it's actually in really nice shape. Of course, it's a single disc, so it's not prone to as much spine wear if it was two discs. This is from that, that same massive lot that was traded into my big uh, major local store, and they're putting them out a handful at a time. So this is technically an X rental, but it's absolutely perfect, and it has the, the little tiny uh, genre sticker in the upper corner. It's still in the original shrink wrap, and this is a much nicer jacket from Warner Brothers than was typical for them. It, you have black on the side instead of silver or a random color. Uh, it has PCM audio, but the only issue is this isn't letterbox. It's actually open matted, so this is a 4.3 presentation instead of the original matted widescreen presentation. So that's why, obviously, you would need to have your, um, your DVD and later copies. But again, I was just always curious to see this on LD and look at the transfer and check the audio, and I never expected to find a beautifully preserved uh, copy with this gorgeous jacket art, so I, I couldn't say no, even though this is an open mat presentation. Next was a really wonderful find in exceptional shape, also from this same lot, uh, but this is a very uncommon disc because it's a much later pressing. This is one of those MGM UA Classics releases that they did in 97, 98, 99 at the end of the format. So this goes on my Victor Fleming shelf. The 1942 adaptation of John Steinbeck's Tortilla Flat with Spencer Tracy and Hedy Lamar and John Garfield. This has the uh, beautiful, very thin but high gloss jacket in full color that they were doing at this time. Uh, this is very much indicative of what these late release classics are like on Laserdisc. This disc was made in 97. It is still very uncommon. Uh, any film from the golden age of Hollywood up through the 50s that would get a very late Laserdisc release like this is usually very uncommon. So 
I couldn't believe this was just in the bin, still in the shrink wrap. It looks like it has never been played. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have any extras, but this was a major spiffing up for this title. It did finally get a DVD release through the Warner Archive, but it never got an official one in like a Spencer Tracy box set. And I'm I'm thinking that that Warner Archive DVD is probably going to be reusing this LD Master. Uh, but this does have PCM mono audio as well, so that's a nice benefit. And also you get this really beautiful beautiful jacket art so I can't wait to check out this film which I haven't seen uh, it's been a long time since I've seen it I saw it on TCM once a very long time ago and I'm curious to to look at it again uh, but uh, th this LD is a perfect way to do it and I couldn't believe this was in the local lot as well for my David Lean shelf, this is another variant I wanted to check for a long time. This is the MGM Dr. Zhivago CLV litter box release. This looks and seems identical to the standard version, but the difference is, if you look down here, you'll see the PG logo is printed on in black and white, and then on the back, there's a little printed on letter box box as well. That's how you tell apart this slightly later pressing that does use the same master. This seemingly came out in about 1992, 93 or so. The top letterbox is now a standard printing, just like a lot of MGM discs, whereas the original version had that sort of gold foil finish to it on some copies. Uh, the older discs were on the silver MGM label and didn't have any chapter stops, whereas this is on the yellow label and actually does claim to have chapter stops. I've heard that the transfer on this is maybe a tad bit sharper because it is later pressing, and this is basically the disc that was available in between the original letterbox release and then the CAV anniversary box set that came later, and itself was supplanted by the AC3 CLV version. Uh, that's basically how it went on LD for the letterbox editions, but this was just one edition that I always wanted to check a copy of, but uh, trying to find this specific version version sometimes people charge more for it or if you're just trying to find the specific different version of a common disc it can get kind of tricky to find a clean one sometimes because they just get elusive just seemingly because it's like oh it knows you want to find it so it's going to be difficult uh, but again the the jacket and everything else is pretty much identical it does have a nice gatefold this does include a small featurette and the original trailer at the end and this was the first time on home video you could actually see this film at least in a letterboxed form as you should because seeing this on VHS and pan and scan was just abominable <laughs> but uh, if, if you are looking for just a standard version of Zhivago on Laserdisc uh, you probably want to go ahead and seek out this one as opposed to the very original pressing of this simply because it's a slightly later pressing that actually does have chapter stops whereas the original unfortunately does not. This next one is for my Sydney Lumet shelf. It is unfortunately not the rarer widescreen presentation, but uh, it's not a very common disc itself, and it was literally a quarter, so I was like, I have to try it. That is the earlier release of Equus. So unfortunately, this is not the widescreen version, but it does have PCM audio. This is a standard image release uh, with the rather striking original artwork with the red, black, and white, but it's just on the generic image jacket. Because this is a two-disc affair, you do get some gatefold action, and it does, actually, it is a wonderful gatefold from Image, because they didn't do a whole lot of gatefolds, and when they did, they, they were kind of hit or miss, so... Uh, this is very impressive, and again, I don't know if this is on the widescreen version. The rear is just standard image fare, uh, but it is nice. This does have PCM audio, and you never know. Sometimes the older non-widescreen versions actually do have a better audio track, so uh, it's always important to not count out previous um, less spiffy and uh, or older transfers simply if they're on older formats or if they're pan and scan or open that because sometimes the audio track can actually be superior to what came later so um, I just picked this up simply for curiosity and to see what the transfer was like and again it was only a quarter for a Sydney Lumet film even if it isn't in widescreen 
Then lastly for the director's shelf, this is one of the few Hollywood films the legendary Jean Renoir made in the 1940s. This is 1943's This Land is Mine from the Archeo Classic Collection from Image. So it's in their typical design. Uh, the image choice is nice, but the, the blue with the gray always kind of looks a little bit weird. Uh, this does have PCM mono audio, but of course being Image, even though it's the Archeo Collection, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the greatest transfer in the world. Uh, but this is still, I, I, I do believe this has gotten some reissues, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, this is one of the Renoir films I've never gotten to see, so this will be a first-time watch for me. I've had it on my watch list for ages, and I couldn't believe I, I found this floating around in the bins. It's in really great shape, still has the original shrink wrap on it, and it has the little um, disc manufactured in Japan, jacket manufactured in USA sticker in terms of the actual manufacturing process for this disc. Uh, it's not common to find RKO discs from this image series in, in really great shape anymore. Usually they're pretty beat up or they have hole punches in them. So even though this is still from that uh, that rental lot, in terms of condition, it's it's practically immaculate except for the, the, the sticker on the label. So uh, this, this will be a first time watch for me and I'm so excited to finally see this. To finish off, I'll just go through the other discs chronologically. And that means starting with the Warner release of 1974's Freebie and the Bean. This is a pretty uncommon disc. Uh, it's one of the nicer Warner letterbox pressings that uses original art, doesn't clutter the cover up with anything. And again, it's actually letterboxed, and it actually tells you it's in widescreen, which Warner rarely ever did. They always hid it somewhere, or they didn't put it on the jacket at all. And they went with a nice color blue to complement the uh, the main color. So this is a nice looking jacket from Warner, which wasn't always the case. Uh, it's just a standard CLV disc. Uh, it does have PCM audio as well. This is now available from the Warner Archive on Blu-ray, which I've been I've had on my wish list. But uh, it was really cool to find this Laserdisc version when it popped up. And again, the widescreen version of this does not pop up very often. So uh, when I found it for cheap, I've been meaning to revisit this film anyway. So this was a great way to do it. Next is another really spiffy late era MGM release with really cool art that I was just surprised to see because I'd forgotten this late version had come out on Laserdisc. So this is the 1997 deluxe letterbox pressing of 1981's The Dogs of War, starring Christopher Walken. This artwork is beautiful and is printed on the thinner jacket with very thick gloss that MGM and Image was using in the last days of Laserdisc. So this is a really beautiful jacket, very frameable. And the rear looks quite nice and has this sort of burnt orange look on the bottom. Uh, it's just film only, but it does include the trailer. And of course, this is a much more spiffed up presentation technically than what we got on previous releases. It does have PCM audio, and I believe this master is what carried over to the MGM DVD release, which came out a couple years later. But still, a, a very cool later release does not pop up very often because, again, this is a 1997 pressing, and uh, the, the jacket art is, is worth the purchase alone, I think. Next was a complete surprise because this film has horrible rights problems. Uh, it doesn't even have a, a release in print anywhere currently that I'm aware of. There's a very crappy uh, 4x3 transfer on DVD that's very old and goes for crazy money because that's the only DVD release. And so you have to go back to VHS and Laserdisc for anything uh, besides that, and they're also 4x3. So I was very surprised to find 1984's All of Me on Laserdisc. This is the HBO video presentation. This is the only LD there is, and it is unfortunately also 4x3. This is the Steve Martin Lily Tomlin comedy that was directed by Carl Reiner, and unfortunately the last time that uh, Reiner and Martin made a film together, this came after the great three films they had made previously, in The Jerk, Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid, and The Man With Two Brains. So this is the one of, of their four teamed up films that you can't really see. Again, it's really in right's hell. Although it did just get a screening at the TCM Film Festival, so I don't know if that means 
uh, the rights maybe finally got worked out somehow or there's a release on the horizon, uh, but that's just my own speculation at this point. This disc still goes for quite a bit of money because, again, there are only three releases of this film and all of them are long out of print. Uh, again, this is 4x3, it's analog audio only, but I am curious to see if the transfer is any good because if it's a solid transfer, at least this is a decent watchable version of the film then um i'm not sure if the dvd which has terrible reviews is based off of this old master or not but again that is also not in widescreen so there is no widescreen version of this film available that i'm aware of and there is no available version of this film period so i've only seen uh portions of this film i've never gotten to see the whole thing so this will be finally me getting to see the film in its entirety even though it's on this very old 1980s ld press presentation. This is from that same rental lot, so it's in excellent shape, and it's an original shrink wrap, so I couldn't believe this was at such a low, low price, because again, if you try to buy a copy of even the Laserdisc or the VHS tape, you are going to have to pay quite a bit, because it is stuck in rights hell. Next is uh, rounding off a trilogy for me, because for some reason, this is the, the one that's elusive of these uh, Paramount upgrades. So I finally found the Paramount widescreen edition of Beverly Hills Cop 2, which rounds off the trilogy for me. This is also from that rental lot, so it has their custom widescreen sticker. It's in the original shrink wrap. It's in really great shape. Uh, this was from the same 1994 widescreen reissue series of the first film, and they did it to tie in with the release of the third film. Uh, the first film in the widescreen version is relatively common. The third one is extremely common because nobody wants it anymore. But uh, two is, is the one that's elusive. So if you, for some reason, want all three films on Laserdisc and you want them in the better widescreen presentations, this is going to be the one that you'll have to probably pay a little bit more for or um, you'll have to spend a while searching for a copy. So uh, I'm, I'm not a giant fan of this particular series. I much prefer 48 hours but i do like the visual some of the visuals that tony scott came up with for this film it, even though it is very light in its plot um it, it does have some interesting visuals and i was just curious about what the laser disc presentation looked like so i always kept an eye out to see if i could find part two so then i could finally have all three films in this nice paramount widescreen reissue series uh, this does have a uh, dolby surrounded code pcm which would approximate its original dolby stereo and i'm sure this is probably going to be the same source as what turned up on dvd um, so this should be a pretty solid looking ld but again this is just one of those that uh, it's one of those sequels and an iconic series that is just much more elusive than the other films in its laser disc edition next from 1992 is a pretty common ld it's a film i've never seen but it was in good shape and it was less than a dollar so i picked up jennifer 8 which is here in this nice paramount widescreen release. Uh, the cast looks pretty solid, and this was shot by the great Conrad Hall. So, of course, that, that sort of piqued my interest. And I'd seen this cover floating around in a lot of different laser disc bins before. So it's a relatively common disc that, if, if you see it for cheap, it's a nice widescreen Paramount release. So, of course, I, I decided to go for it. Uh, it does have PCM audio, Dolby Surround encoded, which would approximate the original release audio. And again, this this will just be a, uh, this was a blind buy, so I'll be watching this on LD for the first time. Next, also from 1992, is another film I've never seen. I've heard about this, and I've seen the trailer and maybe a clip or two, so it's always been on my radar, but I'm now finally going to be able to look at A Midnight Clear, which is again from 1992. It's a It was a pretty well-received a World War II film with more of an anti-war slant to it and a really fantastic cast as highlighted on the rear jacket. This is a Sony pressing, so it has really nice art and their usual liner notes that are pretty extensive. It's just a single CLV disc with Dolby Surround encoded PCM. Uh, since it's Sony, that means the DADC plant, but this doesn't have any reported rot issues, and uh, I don't think it has an Austrian pressing available. Uh, for those unaware, Sony Columbia films on LD were mostly made at the DADC USA plant, which had a significant uh, rot problem with a lot of their releases. So if it's a Sony title or if it's DADC USA, you do want to try and find 
another version in case that copy is rotted. Uh, if you do manage to find copies made at the DADC Austrian plant, those are always rot free, but they only did certain films. Uh, not every DADC release has rot issues, and it is helpful to check the Laserdisc database and look at the little section under rot report to see if anybody's reported issues. So if I find a cheap Sony Columbia disc and it is DADC USA and it is a film I'm interested in, I, I do give that a quick glance just to make sure and uh, this one was fine so I'll be able to check it out here. Next from 1994 is another Sony title that I picked up because it didn't have any reported rod issues and it was super cheap and that is the Louis Malle film Vanya on 42nd Street which I've never seen all of before and the artwork is really nice. It's got a very thick gloss on it. I love the the juxtaposition between the deep blacks and the orange amber and the the reds on this uh, get the deluxe widescreen banner as all sony releases have unfortunately like a lot of their discs it is only a, a single or a standard jacket so it does have some creasing because it is two um two discs inside also because it's sony you get some nice liner notes some nice imagery and you get the chapter breakdown on the bottom uh, this has no special features like most sony discs and of course it will be supplanted by later releases but i thought it was just a, a cool jacket design and i've always meant to see this film in its entirety and the price was right because it was less than a dollar so uh I, you know even you know i see art house film on ld even if it's sony and it's in good shape and it's under a dollar i'm like yes okay it, it's got my name on it. So I'll be spinning this up on LD and checking out the transfer. Again, there are no major reported rot issues, so this should be fine. And I don't think there's an Austrian version available. And then last is 1997's Liar Liar and the classic Universal Signature Collection. So this is a big spiffy special edition from Universal given their full signature treatment. This is also from that massive lot. So it's in perfectly preserved shape with these custom stickers on it. Also indicating that this carries a analog track commentary from the director. So again, this is a full on special edition uh, this was pretty much uh, ported over for its DVD edition. In addition to the director commentary, you get a, a little uh, featurette about the making of the film, in addition to the trailer and various original pr uh, promotional campaign items. So it is a, a nice little supplemental package. As, as far as the film is concerned, it does have the THX mastering stamp. It does have a PCM soundtrack with Dolby Surround encoding, and it also has a Dolby AC3 track as well. Well, uh, it is spread across two discs with a pretty nice little gatefold. So it's uncommon to see signature discs in the wild without a, a nice price tag on them, even when it's a more common one like this. But I definitely didn't expect to see a later signature collection release like this for, you know, $1.99. So that's why I, I couldn't resist this one in such great shape. So that's it for this uh, collection update. Uh, some really interesting things I got from some other sellers and some fantastic finds in local stores. So it always pays to, to haunt your local stores and always double check or if you're ever in a record store and you think they might have laser discs, never be afraid to ask, and there might be that little cardboard box in the back corner somewhere that has some goodies in it. It just goes to prove that you never know what is out there, and even if things seem like they've dried up for a while, then all of a sudden that can turn around, and before you know it, uh, simply from local finds, you're out of space once again, and you're like, why have I gotten so many more LDs? Just when you think you're out, it pulls you right back in with more discs. That's why, I, I, part of the reason why I like going over all my uh, collection update finds in, in video form helps me uh, process what I've gotten and remember what I have and don't have, and I, I think it's cool to go over so people can actually see different things, so hopefully this is been informative and fun and uh, reminds you of things you've been looking to get or things you have in your watch pile that you haven't gotten to yet or uh, dust some discs off the shelf and give them give them a spin and as always keep your disc spinning keep your players going keep physical media alive and thanks ever so much for watching